So, um, in this second lecture, I will try and give you an introduction to the international legal framework for nuclear security. Um, nuclear security, as you can see from this definition, which is a, a bit old, and I think the IEA now uses a broader definition uh, as, uh, as a working definition of nuclear safety, but I still have on this slide an old definition that was adopted in 2002 by an advisory group on nuclear security, which is a group of experts which advises the IEA Secretariat, the DG and the IEA Secretariat on issues of nuclear security. And from this definition, although it's not the more recent one that the IEA uses uh, for working purposes, you can see what I already told you uh, in the previous lecture, that basically the difference between nuclear safety and nuclear security is that whereas nuclear safety is about protecting the outside world from um, the negative consequences that can potentially derive from the peaceful uses of nuclear energy, um, nuclear security is really uh, about trying to avoid outside interference uh, by unauthorized people who may be terrorists or other uh, non-state actors with uh, nuclear material and facilities, which could then result, of course, if in a nuclear safety event, because if there is outside interference with a nuclear facility or with nuclear material, this could then result in a nuclear safety issue if there is a, re a release of uh, radiation. But nuclear security is really about trying to avoid uh, these uh, outside interferences in order to protect nuclear material and associated facilities from um, the unauthorized activities of non-state actors, individuals. Um, so the focus is really on non-state actors. And that is why nuclear security is also different from safeguards, which is, uh, you will hear about it this afternoon, is about the verification of non-proliferation obligations which are placed upon states. So safeguards is really dealing with whether or not states abide by their legal obligations in the area of non-proliferation of nuclear weapons, whereas nuclear security is, trying, is about trying to avoid interference with nuclear um, material and associated facilities from non-state actors. Um, this is an area, by the way, which for a long time was not exactly uh, dealt with within the IEA, uh, because, as I mentioned in my previous lecture, for many years there weren't any treaties in the area of nuclear law except for nuclear liability, which we will deal with in the next lecture. But there were the IEA safety standards. There were the IEA safety standards that the IEA could adopt under its statute. And then at some point, states decided that it was time to adopt binding obligations in the area of nuclear safety. And they started to adopt these various treaties which deal with different aspects of nuclear safety. In the area of nuclear security, there were no standards, because the statute of the IAEA does not specifically empower the IAEA to adopt security standards. It only refers to safety standards. So it, it is an area where gradually um, the member states of the IAEA became aware that there was a need for the IAEA to deal with nuclear security as well. And uh, the Board of Governors started to adopt uh, decisions whereby the IEA Secretariat was decided, was authorized to do a number of things in the area of nuclear safety. These were the so-called nuclear security plans, which were adopted by the Board of Governors, which is one of the governing bodies of the IEA. And, um, but even before these nuclear security plans uh, started, um, at least one treaty was adopted under the auspices of the IEA. This was the Convention on the Physical Protection of Nuclear Material, which was the first binding instrument which was adopted 
not by the IEA, but under the auspices of the IEA, by the IEA member states. This is an important difference because the IEA can't do anything unla unless the member states tell us that we can do something. So the states decided to adopt binding obligations in the area of the physical protection of nuclear material. This convention was then amended in 2005 by the amendment to the Physical Protection Convention, which entered into force in May 2016. Then there are, of course, also non-binding instruments. I don't want to go back to issues that I have already mentioned in my previous lecture concerning nuclear safety. But in nuclear security, we have the same pattern that we see in nuclear safety. On the one hand, we have the treaties, which are binding upon states that have freely consented to become parties to these treaties. And these are the Convention on Nuclear Safety and its 2005 amendment. But we also have non-binding instruments that have been adopted under the auspices of the IEA. One of them we have already mentioned is the Code of Conduct on the Safety and Security of Radioactive Sources, which is uh, important precisely because it deals with both safety and security, and that's why it's relevant also when we describe the legal framework for nuclear security. Um, but um, in the in the area of nuclear security, another an important factor which distinguishes it, if we want, from the area of nuclear safety, from the legal point of view, is the fact that apart from those instruments, binding or non-binding, that have been adopted under the auspices of the IAEA, there are a number of other instruments, um, treaties in particular, but also resolutions of the Security Council of the United Nations that have been adopted outside the framework of the IEA. So the IEA is not the only entity under the auspices of which instruments have been adopted which deal with uh, nuclear security. And for example, we have here, and we will, I will come back to this later, the most important of these treaties that have been adopted outside the framework of the IEA, which is the um, the, um, there are a number of United Nations conventions, conventions that were adopted under the auspices of the United Nations Organization, the most important of which is the International Convention on the Suppression of Acts of Nuclear Terrorism. This convention was adopted, I think it should have been adopted under the auspices of the IEA, but for some reason, <laughs> for political reasons, I think it was the Russian Federation at the time who took the initiative to um, start uh, drafting this convention, they decided that uh, it was better uh, to negotiate this convention and within the United Nations and then have it adopted uh, within the framework of the United Nations organization. Uh, so there are, num there are a number of UN conventions, the most important of which is the uh, um, International Convention on the Suppression of Acts of Terrorism, but there are also uh, other specialized treaties which deal with specific areas where nuclear security is relevant, which have been adopted under uh, specialized agencies of the United Nations. Um, you're probably familiar with the fact that the United Nations family is made not only by the United Nations organization, but by a number of other intergovernmental organizations which are legally separate from the UN, but are part of the United Nations family because um, uh, the UN exercises a supervisory function over these organizations through the Economic and Social Council, mainly, which is an organ of the UN. These organizations are called specialized agencies, and one of them is the International Maritime Organization, under the auspices of which um, two important instruments have been adopted which are relevant for nuclear security. And yet another one is ICAO, which I already mentioned before, which is the International Civil Aviation Organization. Now in this case, it makes more sense that these instruments, these treaties, were adopted outside the framework of, of the IEA, although one may question even that. But at least, you know, these relate to specific aspects of nuclear security, uh, 
which are uh, deal with maritime uh, issues, and that's why they were adopted under the auspices of the International Maritime Organization, which has its headquarters in London, or they deal with civil aviation aspects of nuclear security, and that is why they were adopted under the auspices of the ICAO, which has its headquarters in Montreal, in Canada. Um, and then finally, we have uh, at least two important Security Council resolutions. These are not treaties, but they are also legally binding, like treaties, because, as some of you, I'm sure, know, um, the United Nations Organization um, <coughs> Treaty provides that the Security Council, the Charter of the United Nations, which is the constitutive treaty of the UN, provides that provides that the Security Council, which is an organ of the United Nations, um, under Chapter 7 of the United Nations Charter, when there is um, a threat to the peace, which is a very generic concept, which can encompass everything and its opposite, so it's up to the Security Council mainly to decide when there is an issue which constitutes a threat to international peace, or whether there is an actual breach of the peace, which is a, a more graver situation, a graver situation, or whether there is an act of aggression, which is the most um, important of these situations. But normally, where there is a threat to the peace, the Security Council is empowered under Chapter 7 of the United Nations Charter to adopt binding decisions, which are binding on all UN member states. They are binding because the UN Charter, which is a treaty which have be, has been ratified by the members of the United Nations Organization, uh, the Security Council has this power. And under Chapter 7, the Security Council has adopted at least two important uh, major resolutions which are binding, uh, which are relevant for nuclear security. So the picture from the legal point of view of nuclear security is a little bit more complicated than the picture we've seen in the area of nuclear safety. There we have legally binding and non-legally binding instruments, that, but they have been all adopted under the auspices of the IAEA. Here we have also the same pattern. We have legally binding and non-legally binding instruments. But at least when it comes to the legally binding instruments, some of them have been adopted outside the framework of the IAEA uh, under the auspices of either the United Nations Organization or some of its specialized agencies such as IMO or ICAO. And then we even have decisions by the UN Security Council which are not treaties but are binding on all UN member states. So, as you probably know, maybe I, I didn't say this um, strongly enough in my first lecture, there is a major difference between a UN Security Council resolution based on Chapter 7 and a treaty. Because treaties are legally binding, of course, but they're legally binding only on those states that have freely decided to become parties to these treaties. It's not that once a treaty enters into force, it binds everyone. It only binds those states that have freely consented, normally through an act of ratification, to become parties to the treaty. So it's a voluntary process. Each state has, is free to decide whether or not it wants to become a party to a treaty. Once it has made that decision, it ratifies the treaty, the treaty becomes binding upon that state. When it comes to UN Security Council resolutions, it's more like being within a federal state, in a way, in the sense that the UN Security Council resolution has the power, unlike the IEA, to adopt binding decisions on all UN member states. That means that it's no longer a question of free will, in particular because, as you probably know, the UN Security Council is not made of all UN member states, it's made of 15 UN member states, so 15 UN member states can decide to adopt measures that become binding on all UN member states on the basis of Chapter 7 of the UN Charter when there is a threat to international peace or a breach of the peace 
or an act of aggression. So this is a major development in international law that was uh, made after the Second World War when the United Nations Charter was adopted. So this is the major difference between, from the legal point of view, between um, safety and security. Here we have a number of legally binding instruments that have been adopted outside the framework of the IEA. And we even have at least two decisions of the UN Security Council which are binding on all UN member states, and not only on those states that have freely consented to be bound, as is the case for multilateral treaties. Um, there is also another aspect that I would like to point out from the general point of view, that um, leaving aside the UN Security Council resolutions, which uh, have a more comprehensive uh, scope of application, in particular one of them, if you look at these treaties that have been adopted outside the framework of the IEA, like, for example, uh, the International Convention on the Suppression of Acts of Nuclear Terrorism, or the specific treaties dealing with maritime um, nuclear terrorism that have been adopted under the auspices of the IMO, or of civil aviation, uh, nuclear terrorism that have been adopted under the auspices of ICAO, all of these treaties uh, only deal with one aspect of nuclear security, which is the criminal law aspect. Those of you who are lawyers probably know what criminal law means, at the national level at least. It means that there are a number of offenses which each state decides uh, are criminal offenses in the sense that an individual who is suspected of having committed one of these offenses can be um, arrested and it can also be prosecuted. And if found guilty, it can then be uh, sanctions, sanctioned and put in prison, for example. That is typical of criminal law at the national level. Mo most states have a criminal code. Others do not have a criminal code, but they have common law offenses. They have statutory offenses uh, and so on. At the international level, there have been uh, a number of treaties that have been adopted in the area of criminal law that put upon the state's parties an obligation, an international obligation, to consider certain acts committed by individuals as criminal offenses in their national criminal law. And these treaties then usually also deal with um, international cooperation in criminal matters in order to facilitate the arrest and prosecution of individuals who have committed these criminal acts in the sense that they provide that if an individual is found in the territory of one state and that state does not have uh, a, a direct interest to uh, arrest and prosecute that individual, that state still has to arrest that individual and if he doesn't want to prosecute that individual it will extradite that individual, meaning it will transfer that individual to another state that has a more direct interest in prosecuting that individual. For example, because the criminal act was committed on the territory of that state. Or because that criminal act was committed against a person which is a national of that state. This, these are cases where there is a more direct interest for a state to exercise its criminal jurisdiction vis-a-vis -vis an individual and thereby prosecute that individual than, for example, within another state where the individual may be present at some point, but the offense was not committed there, it wasn't committed against any national of that state, and therefore that state does not have such a direct interest in prosecuting that individual. But because the treaties have, these international criminal law treaties have uh, the aim of facilitating the prosecution of this individual so that there can be no safe haven for people who have committed these offenses that are of an international character, um, then there is an obligation for the state to extradite that individual so that it can be tried in another state that has a more direct interest in prosecuting. So this is the criminal international criminal law aspect. And these treaties that have been adopted under the uh, auspices of organizations other than the IEA uh, 
mostly or exclusively deal with this aspect of nuclear security. There are certain acts um, which are relevant for nuclear security which have to be considered as criminal offenses and in respect of which states have an obligation to either prosecute or extradite the individual who is suspected of having committed one of these offenses. When we look at other aspects of nuclear security, like the actual measures that a state has to take in order to protect nuclear facilities or nuclear material from the interference of these individuals, so the preventive aspects, if we want, of nuclear security, we don't want these offenses to be committed, and therefore we take a number of measures in order to protect, physically protect, nuclear facilities or nuclear material from outside interference, then if we don't succeed, then we will prosecute the individual who has committed that act. But even before that, we need to take measures to avoid that and physically protect and do other things that may be important in order to prevent these criminal offenses to be committed. So this aspect of nuclear security is not dealt with by these treaties that have been adopted outside the framework of the IEA. It's only the IEA that has adopted either binding, or uh, actually, it's only within the framework of the IEA that states have adopted binding treaties in this area. And the IEA has also adopted a number of non-binding instruments, which we will see are called new security recommendations that deal with this, which is probably the most important aspect of nuclear security because nuclear security is much more than simply the criminalization of certain acts committed by certain individuals. We'll see this, for example, in the Convention on the Physical Protection of Nuclear Material, which is the first uh, convention that was adopted uh, in this area, and it was adopted under the auspices of the IEA. This convention has, at the moment, 155 states parties, uh, the scope of the convention is threefold in the sense that it deals with the physical protection of nuclear material and then it deals with the criminal law aspect, so the criminalization of offenses. And then it deals, the third aspect, with international cooperation and information exchange. So there is one aspect of the CPPNM, which is the criminalization of offenses. But there is only one aspect of the convention perhaps not even the mo most important aspect of the convention. The most important aspect is the first one, the physical protection aspect. Here again we see the usual pattern that we've seen in nuclear safety. When states decide to sit down and adopt a treaty, they discuss its scope of application, and there will be some who want the scope of application to be very broad, there will be others who want the scope of application to be very narrow, and then there will be inevitably a compromise. And this is what happened when this convention was adopted. Although it has a very general title, like the CNS, Convention on Nuclear Safety, has a very general title, but then if we look at the contents of the convention, we see that it only applies to the safety of nuclear power plants, so it has a very narrow scope of application, compared with the concept of nuclear safety as a general concept. Here, the convention is called Convention on the Physical Protection of Nuclear Material, but actually, the articles are in the convention that oblige states to adopt measures to physically protect nuclear material only apply to nuclear material which is being transported from one state to another, to nuclear material which is in international transport. That was a compromise at the time. States didn't want to adopt binding rules relating to the physical protection of nuclear material in general. They said, oh, we only want to deal with the transboundary issues. When it's a purely national issue, because there is nuclear material which is in domestic use, storage, or transport, we don't want to be binding, bound by any international treaties. This is a matter for national sovereignty. Each state has to decide freely by itself how, if and how it wants to protect nuclear material at the national level. So that was the compromise when the convention was adopted. So actually, the scope of application of the convention, when it comes to physical protection, is rather narrow. Fortunately, when it comes to the criminalization aspect, the scope is not so narrow, because there are a number of acts which are 
criminalized by the Convention, which means that the state's parties has to consider these acts as criminal offenses in their national criminal law, which um, relate to, out, let's say in general, unauthorized interference with nuclear material by private individuals. And these are of quite general application. It doesn't matter anymore whether this outside in unauthorized interference is with nuclear material which is being transported from one state to another. They just apply to any outside interference with nuclear material, whether it's in domestic or international transport. So they have a broader scope of application. Um, the, the article relating to criminalization of offenses. And then, of course, there are the, a number of other articles that deal with jurisdiction, extradition, cooperation in criminal matters, and so on. And there also are, are in the Convention, a number of provisions relating to international cooperation and information exchange um, among the state's parties. But I don't want to go into details because we don't have too much time. However, you know, this was a compromise when the Convention was adopted. At some point, it was realized that the scope of the Convention was too narrow. In particular, as regards physical protection, it was realized that it's not true that any state should be free to decide by itself whether or not and how to protect nuclear material in domestic use, storage, and transport. And that there was a need for international binding obligations even for nuclear material in domestic use, storage, and transport, and for nuclear facilities that are by definition within a state's territory. And that is why, at some point, um, negotiations started that um, the outcome of which was the adoption of the amendment to the CPPNM, which was adopted in 2005. This amendment took many years to enter into force. It only entered into force, as I mentioned, uh, last year. Uh, because um, the Convention on the Physical Protection of Nuclear Material has a provision relating to its amendment, which puts a very high threshold on the entry into force of any amendment to the Convention that may be adopted. So this amendment was adopted in 2005. But the Convention provides that any amendment to the Convention only enters into force once it has been ratified by two-thirds of the contracting parties to the Convention. This is a very high threshold. If we look at some of the other treaties that have been adopted in the area of nuclear security outside the framework of the IEA, uh, which entered into force much sooner than the amendment to the CPPNM, well, we'll see that the reason was that the threshold for entry into force was much lower. Of course, if you put a low threshold and you say the amendment will enter into force once it's been ratified by five states, you will have an amendment that will enter into force very soon. It's not very difficult to find five states who will ratify an amendment. But then, of course, you will end up with an amendment that is only in force for five states, and the others may join at a later stage, and God knows when. So the decision was taken uh, when the Convention on the Physical Protection was adopted that because this is a sensitive area, any amendment to the Convention should enter into force when there was broad consensus. And broad consensus meant for those states at the time, at least two-thirds of the state's parties must have consented to be bound. And this threshold was reached only last year, and that's why the amendment entered into force so long after its original adoption in 2005. Um, so, but now it's in force. It's in force for those states that have ratified it, and the IEA, of course, is working on uh, getting all uh, the other states' parties to the CPPNM, which have not yet ratified the amendment, to also, to also ratify it so that everyone will be party to the amended convention. The amended convention has an extended scope of application uh, in all three areas. But I think the most important one is the first one, physical protection. Because as I mentioned, the CPPNM, despite its very general title, had a very, very narrow scope. It only applied to the physical protection of nuclear material while in international nuclear transport. 
Here, at last, states realized that this was not acceptable, that there was a need for obligations in the broader area of the physical protection of nuclear material and nuclear facilities, and therefore the amendment now covers the physical protection of nuclear material in not only in international transport, but also in domestic storage, use and transport, and it also applies to the protection of nuclear facilities. So the, um, and the important thing about this aspect is that the convention, unlike the original, the amendment, sorry, unlike the original convention, has a number of obligations that a state has to abide to regarding the national legal framework uh, relating to the protection of nuclear material and nuclear facilities. Um, there are a number of general principles that have to be um, um, abided by the state's parties that relate to the independence of the regulatory authority and other aspects which are familiar to those who deal with nuclear safety but in the area of nuclear security have been for the first time uh, put into binding rules uh, by the amendment to the physical protection of nuclear material. Uh, there is also an extended scope of the criminalization provisions because new offenses have been added which relate to the nuclear um, smuggling, illicit trafficking, and sabotage of nuclear facilities and nuclear material. The original convention mainly uh, related to the unauthorized possession, use, transfer, disposal uh, of nuclear material that could cause, that caused or could cause uh, injury uh, to third parties. It applied to robbery or theft of nuclear material. And now we have these additional offenses which relate to nuclear smuggling and illicit traffic, trafficking and sabotage of nuclear material and nuclear facilities. And then we have an expanded scope of the provisions on international cooperation among states. Now, within the IEA, um, apart from the Physical Protection Convention and its amendment, we then have a number of non-binding uh, non um, instruments that have been adopted under the auspices of the IEA or by the IEA directly, um, like in the area of nuclear safety. Um, I think the most important one, as we've already mentioned, is the Code of Conduct, which is important because the CPPLM and its amendment do not cover radioactive sources. They only cover nuclear material, which is defined in such a way to exclude radioactive sources. So again, uh, this is a pattern that we've seen in nuclear safety as well. States are not prepared to adopt binding obligations for activities which they consider, rightly or wrongly, to be less risky. So for sources which are risky but are not as risky as nuclear material, there is only a code of conduct. Also for the security aspect, there is no international convention. There are those who would like to transform the code of conduct into a binding treaty. But so far, this uh, tendency has not reached the stage where states are prepared to consider whether or not to turn this code of conduct into a binding, binding treaty. Um, we have then what might be called the equivalent of the IEA safety standards. So I've, I've said that the statute of the IEA only provides for the IEA to adopt safety standards, but the practice has developed whereby the IEA also adopts um, nuclear security recommendations. And the number of such recommendations have been adopted, which are published in the IEA nuclear security series. Uh, the most important of these is also known uh, as IMSERC 225-REF5, because it's also published as an information circular. IMSERCs are information circulars that the IEA produces for the information of its member states. And one of these uh, relates to um, recommendations providing guidance for um, the physical protection of nuclear material and nuclear facilities. This is very important because it goes into details, like the safety standards go into technical details, the nuclear security recommendations go into technical details which are not in the conventions. The conventions uh, have a more general, um, more general provisions, but so the recommendations will actually facilitate states in abiding by their obligations under the CPPNM and its amendment because they will provide more technical rules and guidance that states will incorporate, if not at the level of legislation, 
at the level of secondary legislation or regulations that will be adopted um, by a government or by a regulatory authority within a state to provide the details. Uh, but there are nuclear security recommendations. Uh, this is the most important ones, but we also have nuclear security recommendations relating to um, radioactive material, uh, which are not covered by the CPPNM. So uh, the, the IEA recommendations go beyond the scope of what is uh, obligatory for states under the CPPNM and its amendment. And we also have recommendations for nuclear material and radioactive material out of regulatory control, which is nuclear materials. As experts on nuclear security will be able to explain better to you, uh, these are nuclear or radioactive materials which are no longer under the control of a regulatory authority, but may also be interfered with by non-state actors and therefore pose a nuclear security threat. And there are nuclear security recommendations for those as well. Now, if you go outside the, U the, the IEA, we will find, as we've seen before, a number of treaties that have been adopted in order to cover specific aspects of um, nuclear security. Under the auspices of the IEA, we have at least three important treaties that are relevant for nuclear security. But I would like to emphasize once more that unlike the CPPNM and its amendment, these treaties are really exclusively or almost exclusively about the criminalization aspect of nuclear security. They don't deal with physical protection. They only deal with those acts that a state has to consider as criminal acts under its criminal law, and they deal with, uh, they contain provisions on how to facilitate at the international level the arrest, prosecution, extradition of individuals who are suspected of having committed one of these acts. Um, you see the conventions listed there. Uh, the most important of these conventions is the United Nations Convention for the Suppression of Nuclear Terrorism. This is important because it covers uh, criminal acts, unauthorized criminal acts, which are related not only to nuclear material like or facilities like the CPPNM and its amendment, <coughs> but also radiological. So it has a broader scope of application than the CPPNM and its amendment because it deals with radiological material other than nuclear material as well. But on the other hand, it doesn't deal with physical protection. It has some provisions, but these provisions basically mostly refer to the IEA uh, measures relating to physical protection. So these conventions, like the other UN conventions, is basically a criminal law convention doesn't deal with other aspects of nuclear security except through referring to the IEA. Then we have another, uh, the other conventions that have been adopted by specialized agencies of the United Nations, IMO and ICAO, which deal with specific acts relating to um, new maritime terrorism or um, aviation terrorism, and specifically relate to offenses which have to do with um, nuclear or radioactive material. So they are also relevant for the purposes of nuclear security, but again, they only deal with the criminal law aspect of nuclear security. Um, the fact that there are so many conventions about the deal with the criminal law aspect of nuclear security may give the impression that it's actually very difficult for a state to abide at the national level with all of these conventions. There are so many of them. We have the CPPNM and its amendment. We have the three United Nations conventions. We have the IMO conventions. We have the ICAO conventions. But actually, a good criminal lawyer, I mean, I'm, I'm not rating myself as a good criminal lawyer because I'm not a criminal lawyer at all, but I think a good criminal lawyer can uh, <coughs> adopt or can can advise a state to adopt criminal law provisions that can comply with all of these conventions without having to have too many separate articles, one on uh, the CPPNM, one on the CPPNM amendment, one on the UN conventions, one on the ICAO conventions, one on the IMO. You can have relatively simple criminal law provisions that cover all of these offenses, which at the international level 
are covered by different treaties. It's not so difficult um, for a good criminal lawyer to devise a way whereby through the adoption of a relatively low number of criminal law and procedure provisions, a state can abide by all of these treaties together. And finally, we have the Nuclear, United Nations Security Council resolutions. There are two of them that I think um, need to be recalled. One of them was adopted almost uh, immediately after the events of 9-11 in the United States of America and the aftermath of these deadly terrorist acts. There was a United Nations Security Council, um, 1373, adopted under Chapter 7 of the United Nations Charter and therefore legally binding, at least on UN member states, which is about the prevention and suppression of terrorist financing, but not only of terrorist financing. So the financing of terrorism, this is a relatively new aspect, which was then also um, translated into a convention on the suppression of terrorist financing by the UN, which you've seen in that list of United Nations Convention which are relevant for nuclear security. Um, it's also about the prevention and criminalization of terrorist acts. So most of what this convention, of what this resolution provides, you can already find in international treaties. But of course there is a big difference from the legal point of view because as I mentioned before, international treaties are only binding on those that have ratified these treaties freely decided to ratify them, whereas this resolution is binding on all UN member states. So they're, they're mainly important um, in a transitory period before everyone has ratified the treaties. They also have provisions that go beyond the treaties, but I think mostly they are important because they make it binding for everyone to abide by rules that under treaty law are only binding on those states that have freely decided to ratify e each of the treaties that we have mentioned before. We also have another UN Security Council resolution, 1540, that was adopted in 2004, again under Chapter 7 of the United Nations Charter, which um, deals with, it's about the non-proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, but not so much from the point of view of the uh, IA safeguards because it deals with um, non-state actors. So it's a non-proliferation. Uh, what the convention, what, what this resolution wants to prevent is non-state actors becoming involved with activities that may lead to uh, the building of weapons of mass destruction, including nuclear weapons. So it does contain a number of provisions which are very directly relevant uh, for nuclear security. Some of them, again, you will also find that are similar or corresponding to legal obligations under existing treaties. And in this case, the main importance of this resolution is the fact that it makes it binding for all UN member states, whereas the treaties only oblige those that have freely ratified them. But the, the resolution also goes beyond and regulates a number of other aspects which are not necessarily covered by international, by international treaties. Both these resolutions, so uh, 1373 and 1540, establish Security Council committees which are composed of members of the Security Council which have the competence to monitor the observance of the resolutions by the UN member states. Again, there is a reporting system. States have to report to these committees on how they abide by their obligations. And the Security Council committee uh, is there to verify or monitor how states comply with these resolutions. What happens if they don't comply? In theory, because this has not happened yet, the United Nations Security Council is in a better position than the IEA to adopt sanctions because under Chapter 7 of the United Nations Charter, if a state does not comply with any of these resolutions, the Security Council could decide that that state's behavior is a threat to the peace and adopt sanctions against that state, economic sanctions or other kinds of sanctions, which again will have to be adopted by UN member states, but they're more, much more effective than what the IEA can do. But of course, this can only happen if there is a consensus within the Security Council, because as you know, the Security Council is composed of 15 states, five of which are permanent members, 
uh, and these five permanent men members have a veto power. So no Security Council resolution can be adopted under Chapter 7 unless the five permanent members are in agreement. If one of them is not in agreement, there will be no sanctions uh, against a state that the Security Council Committee may have found to be not in compliance with the Security Council resolution. So finally, these are conclusions. One of the mantras that you will hear if you uh, participate in activities within the IEA is the concept that responsibility for nuclear security rests entirely with each state. Legally speaking, this is a mantra because this is true for every activity. It's an aspect of national sovereignty that states are free to decide on what to do within their borders. And it could be relevant for nuclear safety just as well as for nuclear security. But in the era of nuclear security, because of the sensitivity of nuclear security, states like to repeat this whenever they have an occasion to. Nuclear security is the exclusive responsibility of each state. At the same time, the recognition that there is a need for international cooperation has increasingly been recognized within the international community, and that uh, has been uh, translated in the adoption of these treaties, the treaties that we have seen uh, were adopted under the auspices of the IEA, and those that were adopted are, are outside the framework of the IEA, or non-binding instruments. So the need for international op cooperation is recognized as extremely important. Um, there is a publication which the IEA has um, issued which goes into more details about what I've been introducing to you today. So if you're interested, this is also available online. Uh, it can be freely downloaded through the um, website of the IAEA. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Andrea, you for this comprehensive presentation. You've managed to keep it. It was not simple within the allocated time. And uh, therefore, I would suggest to you that before we move to the last item this, of this morning, liability, we could accommodate a couple of questions, if any. And I recognize one, Madame.